All right, we are again with another Finding the Balance and uh, still with that theme song unfixed. But I was thinking about it, and I guess this is my problem. I was thinking about it this weekend, and uh, I might have some time actually to get started at least on fixing the theme song. I mean, if you're not really, let me fix my hair a little bit here. Uh, if you're not really like a super into music, I guess, uh, it doesn't bother you, but I, it, it constantly bothers me, but I don't really fix it. Um, but I'm going to try and get to it. Um, uh, so yes, this is, uh, finding the balance with me, Chase. Um, and, uh, I, I, unlike my last one, which was on, uh, a layman's introduction to the Trinity. This one has no notes to it whatsoever. Um, I'm going completely off the cuff here, so this could turn into a mess. Um, hopefully it doesn't. Hopefully I'm, I'm more or less concise in the points I want to make and, and then not too boring. See, one of the reasons, one of the other reasons I like to do the writing, writing it out is because I think when I'm, I, like I said, I, I, I write better than I speak. And so when I talk, I tend to be kind of not sure long winded sound is exactly right, but slow. And I'm afraid that's kind of like, <laughs> I'm afraid that can be a little bit boring. And I, I try not to be, it's, it's, I guess, you know, it's just, especially in today's day and age, I guess I can't completely be too hard on myself because most people today just don't want to listen to something that's rather lengthy um and that's unfortunate it's really sad and i think that needs to be fixed but it's the way it is um so what i wanted i, I wanted to talk about something today i want to try and squeeze in a couple different things uh for this first part though i'm just going to forewarn you this is about this is probably something that you're not going to care too much about um but i wanted to talk about this this is kind of, this is me nerding out a little bit but um uh it kind of comes completely out of nowhere too. So um, I get it if it's not your thing. I'm just forewarning you. And I, I think what I'll do is I'll put it in the timestamp that if you want to just skip this part, just skip this part. This is going into the elements and the subject of storytelling. Oh, excuse me. Uh, storytelling. Uh, and uh, the reason why I do these is because storytelling, I think, is... is I'm, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about storytelling. I think storytelling has a greater impact on our thinking than we tend to admit and to really contemplate. Um, I think it's an area where Christians can have a huge impact if they would just get a little more into it. <laughs> um, and I try to, I, I, I want to be one of those people um, who's aware of that at least. So what I, I I wanted to make a few comments on something. That's why I'm just kind of just nerding out here a little bit on uh, I guess the the apocalyptic genre in general of of you know end of the world dystopian stuff um, that is related to a, a video game that I honestly kind of I don't really follow and that comes out in the fact that I've have not sat down to watch this new game uh like any kind of anybody play this game i'm not i'm certainly not going to buy the game at all um uh, i wasn't even interested in buying the last game but even though i was interested in the storyline uh and so i i just went on youtube and i just watched uh, somebody i, I watched a, a playthrough of it uh and get a commentary on it and stuff like that and, and so um, but this new one, I especially from the things I was hearing about it, I was like, eh, I'm not sure I'm really going to be into this one. I saw all the trailers to it, so it was sort of the teaser trailers, and it really kind of made me go, hmm. Mm. Um, but I, I follow, I, I really follow video game uh, stories because again, that's a form of storytelling, and I really, I, I think like you know Francis Schaeffer, one of the things he's try, he was trying to get across in his How Shall We Then Live. Um, or how then shall we live? One of the two. I always get it mixed up, but it's the same thing. Um, he was trying to get across to people how 
the culture and especially really you can you can get an idea of where the culture is going based upon the writing the poetry and in our case movies tv shows and all that stuff you can you can really get an idea a great idea of where the society is going based on what you're seeing but long before he said long before the philosophers got any wind of it although i kind of I don't know. I, I don't see it his way. I honestly think the philosophers were way ahead of a lot of the artists and stuff like that. The artists pick up on it, um, and I don't think they do it intentionally. I think it's just subconscious, and they just sort of end up bringing the stuff out in their their art, art, their art, because a lot of the existential stuff that artists that were conveying their what they were doing um, about you know what they believed about the world in the past. Um, you can find a philosopher who is already saying stuff like that well before that artist came on came on the scene, and so um, I th I think uh, kind of a little bit in reverse of Schaefer in that way. But that doesn't mean, of course, um, you know, it was a little bit of a rabbit hole. But that doesn't mean that that um, uh, what that that stories and and paying attention to the trends and what you know, like the wokeness stuff going on right now. That you can't learn about the way the society is thinking and where the society is going by you know looking at these things so you can still learn a lot obviously so it'll it'll teach you where we're going so this there's a new game that just came out and it's it's again it's, it's part of my news feed uh sort of uh where i you know, just basically my stream of news um it's part of one of the branches you could say it's a game called The Last of Us Two. Um, now, like I said, I play. I didn't. I didn't play. I, I watched a commentary on the first Last of Us, and I've seen stuff on Last of Us Two. Um, and it was. Uh, I'll just say that it's a strange game to say the very least, uh, story wise. From what I can, from what I I can see, it it got the Last of Us got taken over by the woke brigade. Um, now, Last of Us itself, I thought was a was a pretty good story. I mean, I wasn't blown away by it by any stretch of the imagination. I thought it was a little bit overrated, but I liked the concept of it a lot. It was a concept that you don't see a whole lot in video games, especially. Excuse me. Um, but I, I did like the concept. Now, the, the whole premise is uh, it goes. It, it's like all your other dystopian zombie shows slash movies slash stories um, where you know the world has gone to to poop and uh, you know the, the government's all gone and, and it's just anarchy everywhere and la 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 you know like the walking dead stuff but they're now they're, the zombies in this one are a little bit different they, they they're different in this in um, how should I put this? They're it, conceptually they're basically the same thing, um, but the way they're different is you know I guess you can understand the difference between zombies and infected. Zombies are really more of a supernatural thing where literally the dead comes back to life, which is what you kind of have with The Walking Dead. Um, it's kind of necromancy, really. Uh, so that's inherent. That has zombie uh, zombification has inherent within it a form of uh, magic stuff, you know. So now that's different than being infected. Infected is more of a scientific approach to the whole genre, even though they're con again conceptually basically the same thing. Even as uh, although it characteristically that the creatures would behave in different ways. Um, so infected basically means you're not a zombified, necromanced creature human being or whatever you are you you're suffering from some kind of disease uh rapid infection so you know world war z would be something like that um where it's more of an infection that and it's, so it's not in the realm of the supernatural it's more it's in the realm of the physical some kind of uh, uh rabid thing going on that's kind of like 28 days later 28 weeks later that's that's where that is uh Excuse you, man. I'm really tired. I 
uh, got up this morning, went to the abortion clinic, and uh, didn't eat breakfast, and just really, really tired. So I'm, I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try and push out as much energy as I possibly can. So bear with me here. Now, um, so, but the, 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 the infected, I guess you could say, in, in, in Last of Us Two is. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, I'll just say that, I guess. Different kinds of infected that you got to deal with and, and stuff like that. But um, I think The Last of Us 2 is suffering the same problem, honestly, as The Walking Dead. Um, and that's one of the main things I want to talk about. But before I do that, one of the things I want to say that I, I've been watching a lot of the stuff, the criticisms of The Last of Us 2. Now, the, that's that's the lore of Last of Us, you know, the zombies and everything's going to poop and everything like that. Uh, but in 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 the Last of Us, the the story focuses on a, 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 who you mostly play in the first game as Joel, a guy named Joel. He's lost his daughter in the in the affection. So again, he's this guy who's all nihilistic, you know, and it's just kind of honestly when you really sit back, it's not a very original story. Even though again kind of like one of the things I've always said it's it's not it's not the originality of your story that really draws people in it's mostly the characters if your characters are interesting then you could make almost not always but almost all the typical mistakes or just commit all the standard stereotypes any other story does and it'll be a good story just because of the characters if you make good characters and that's what Last of Us really does I think it makes good characters does a good job at delving into the characters, even though again they they themselves aren't terribly original, um, but um, they just spend a lot of time on the characters, and that's that it works. So, um, um, Joel is tasked. You know, this is here again. Here's this guy, nihilistic guy, whatever, uh, just trying to survive. Um, doesn't really care about anybody else, but and it just cares about surviving. That's it. And then all of a sudden he's got to take this young girl, this little girl named Ellie, uh, across the country, the 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 infected ridden country and the anarchy ridden country, keep her safe to get to this place because she's an immune, she's immune to the disease and whatever that's 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 caused the black plague all over the world really, um, and so got to get her across the the country safely. Now that that's basically the plot uh, of Last of Us, and she's a little girl, you know, is not. She's she, she obviously is willing to do whatever it takes to survive, but she's still a kid, and I think the game does a good job of making sure to remember that she's still a little girl, um, and I think that's one of the reasons why people love the game because here's a little girl you have to protect this little girl, and you see throughout the the the, the movie not the movie <laughs> the game. Um, in the cutscenes and whatnot, and in even in even in the action scenes, you see the the relationship between Ellie and, and Joel go, grow. Obviously, what's what's happening here is is a redemption story for Joel, um, who's become a brute. He's become just a cruel man, be, and, you know, bitter man after losing his daughter and everything like that. And, and so Ellie sort of becomes a surrogate daughter to him to lead him towards the path of redemption. Again, it's kind of your typical thing but it's still a good story you know especially if you do the story right and i think last of us did do it right um so that that was that and 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 the reason why people again are compelled to play is because they want to see joel and ellie's story end, and they want to see they hope that, to see it end well um that they kind of ride off into the sunset father daughter you know joel's happy again and everything like that ellie's got a father too and so you know these kinds of things that we want to see that happen and that's why we're invested in the story like i said that's honestly i think the main key if i can give you just one piece of advice for storytelling make good characters um and put good characters together and then a lot of times the plot can be kind of dull and almost uninteresting and just sort of generic everybody's in it for the characters they want to see the characters pull through that's i think honestly is what really what what really really works so um i think it's your foolproof in other words it, you know if everything if all else fails good characters you know <laughs> um so anyways uh, i'm not saying make make dull and uninteresting plots by the way it's always good to do but if you can't think of a whole lot if it's just really hard 
make good characters. Anyways, um, so that's Last of Us, okay? And and it, it was a good it was a good um, a good story. But now, um, Last of Us Two. I think where Last of Us Two came up, came down is is uh, kind of threw all that away. Um, this is the problem with 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 good franchises. You notice the the franchises that started good, out good and they buy into the wokeness. What do they do? They they throw everything that was before out. They just completely just they really just throw it out. Now when I say throw it out, I don't mean that they they pretend like it never happened. In Last of Us Two. Clearly, it's part of the lore building off of Last of Us. It's supposed to, anyway. So it it's presupposes all that happened. But, you know, it doesn't really continue from there. It, it changes course completely. Um, and, you know, Joel, who's a beloved character, spoiler alert, he, he's killed off in Last of Us 2. So obviously fans are like, what? You can't do that. Um, now, here's one of the things I think. Here's one of the things I I don't see a whole lot of discussion about that I think is one of the big failures of The Last of Us 2, and that is Ellie. Now, again, everybody loved Ellie in the first one. Um, I'm not sure exactly what they think about Ellie in the second one. But one of the things that was disturbing to me about Ellie and it's what was a deterrent to me, and it goes back to in The Last of Us, a scene where Joel and Ellie are just about at their goal and their relationship has really grown since they first met and they really come to really care about each other a lot and Joel sees her as you know her daughter really well, there's a scene where they're moving through this this old and you know again abandoned city and Ellie sees a giraffe she had never seen a giraffe before if I recall she sees this, this giraffe just eating, you know, sort of uh, vines that have grown on this building. You know, again, there's just animals just running around all over the place. You know, it's just the way it is. And she's captivated by it. It's it's fascinating to her. It's it arouses her curiosity, and she's it's just it's a moment of innocence. And that's the Ellie we see in Last of Us. We see at least from what I've I've seen. I haven't watched a commentary on Last of Us 2, so I admit that. We've seen none of that in Ellie in Last of Us 2. She really becomes more of a... She becomes more dark. And almost as nihilistic as Joel was when he started. Um, and it, she only... Honest, honest, and then with Joel's death, she kind of just progressively becomes worse. Um, she's a... She's obviously the, the, the protagonist, but... She's a vicious person, a ruthless person. She's cold, and that innocence is just gone. She's got a tattoo right here, and um, and she's older, yeah. But that I think that's the thing that was completely gone in Ellie is the innocence. Um, now, again, I understand that you're in a dystopian future. There's not a whole lot of room for just being a very nice and innocent person obviously i'm going to talk about dystopianism in a second but um and, uh and and why i honestly think the genre has been beaten up to death and when you think about it could never really work and it's in, in my mind not believable anymore um as when i say and when i say not believable anymore i'm not saying that there was a point where, where dystopian stories were believable and not now they just kind of got dull no i mean just literally the whole idea of his of his dystopian future is completely unbelievable. Anyways, uh, I get to that in a second. But again, like I understand that that there's an element where you obviously you have to grow up uh, and, and stuff like that. But um, there that doesn't mean that. I mean, you you look at. Uh, before the United States was what we know it as today, the, the, the Western frontier, obviously there was a lot of anarchy and stuff like that going on at that time too, um, believe it or not. Almost like this, almost, not quite, but almost like the world that you find in Last of Us 2. Uh, you know, the Wild West with the Indians um, as well, the natives. Um, you didn't really, 
have a whole lot. You couldn't rely too much on the federal government when you the farther west you went. Um, that's why they called it the Wild West. But that didn't mean that girls who were growing up just turned into just what Ellie turns into. They were still women. Um, and that's something I, I think is missing. That's I, I think has made Ellie unattractive, to be honest with you. Um, now obviously they made her a lesbian and what I, I'm trying not to comment on that, even though, you know, me as a Christian, uh, you know, you should know where I stand on that, but I'm trying to kind of put that to the side right now and just talk about the story itself, the character development, Ellie, that was an important part of sympathizing with Ellie in other words, and it's gone. And that's why it was hard to sympathize with her. When, when Joel gets killed, Ellie just, the whole story revolves around Ellie just going on a, a, a vengeance spree. And so that's missing, that the innocence is gone, um, that that the, the f girl of Ellie is gone. And it's one of my big problems with storytelling today is feminism and whatever and all this stuff, you know, girl power, blah, 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 blah. Um, ends up destroying womanhood which i think is beautiful i think it's i think womanhood is beautiful uh in my the story that i'm writing um the novel series one of my characters well i have a lot of female characters in there but i'm gonna talk about one in particular her name is anastaria um and she's a a, a kind of like your warrior princess you could say uh i know that sounds very generic but i i think if you read it it's not gonna be it's nothing like that um, she is a strong warrior, part of her Elvis tribe, and um, she believes in her cause. And she's she can, part of my French, she can kick some ass, you know. And, and she's a she's a fighter. Um, at the same time, though, I want to make sure that I get across. And you you read this in the in the, uh, the novel that I'm, I'm, I'm which which she's in, uh, Dark Skies. Um, uh, you see elements where she's still a woman she's a girl and she likes girl things she can't explain why she likes them but it's just because that's just the way she is she for example loves flowers she's and she's kind of ashamed of it too you see so she kind of tries to hide it you know that she has this love for flowers my dog's growling over there don't worry about them <laughs> um but she loves flowers and 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 uh you know it, it, it's it's just part of her being a, a woman a girl um, and I have another girl who will be introduced later on in the story in another book who's also likewise fighter um, and, and all that stuff but you'll see elements of she's a girl and she still loves to wants to be a girl um, even though she's a fighter and so there's just this horrible imbalance with, with the wokeness that if you want to be feminine, you've got to basically do guy things and not like girl things. And I'm like, why? Why? You know, <laughs> why can't you be a fighter? I, I you know, in, in the UFC, uh, one of my favorite female fighters in the UFC, Valentino Shevchenko. She's her nickname is the bullet. She's an amazing fighter. Man, she's a great fighter. Um, and she's also attractive. Um, she loves guns. She's a, she, I mean, she is like, she's pretty tomboyish, really. Um, but I also saw a video. She's wearing a nice traditional dress. It's not like short, short or anything. It goes, it, you know, it was, it was just kind of a plain dress, straps about this long, you know, on her shoulders. Um, and, you know, kind of bunches up right at the waist, at the waist area. And then the, the rest of the, the skirt gives out, goes all the way past her, her knees and everything. I forgot what color it was. It was one color, a one color piece, one piece. Um, and she's dancing. She's doing this really wonderful dance. Here's this fighter, this UFC fighter. She's a tough girl, can kick ass. And yet she's dancing like a woman. She's got her hair out. And I, I thought, I think that's beautiful. I think that's awesome. That's kind of intimidating, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, and she's a great dancer. Not, not, I'm not talking about you know strip club dancing. I'm talking about traditional dancing. She's doing this kind of twirl thing. I thought that was really cool. I have a whole lot of respect for that. I think that's attractive. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think most people, and by the way, most of your gamers are guys, aren't really attracted to that. And that's the other thing with this Abby girl who's in there. I'm not going to talk too much about that because I've gotten way too much on this. But the Abby girl is 
I don't know what's going on with that. Um, this insanely, unnaturally bulky woman. Uh, you know, I, again, go back to the UFC. There are women in the UFC. You look at the women in the UFC. Obviously, you can tell they work out. They got some guns. I mean, a heck of a lot bigger than my arms. Um, and it's they've got guns, but they're not like you can still tell. You can always still tell that's a woman's body. That that's obviously a female body kind of thing. But this Abigail in this game, that ain't that ain't female bulkiness. That's man bulkiness. They said that that's not. She's not a a a, a, a transgender or anything like that. I think honestly she is. They just didn't want to say it because they knew it's ridiculous. Um, uh, but um, uh, because again, to be a trans, to really be a trans. Gender, you have to have these hormone treatments constantly. Where the hell are you going to get that in a dystopian apocalypse? You can't. It's it is so dumb, it is ridiculous, it is stupid. It demonstrates how wokeness is completely separated from reality. It and that's one of the reasons why the story I think didn't work. Um, but um, she is not female bulky. Okay, Ellie might be. You can see Ellie's kind of got some muscle, but uh, it's obviously very girlish, you know, muscle. Which isn't a bad thing, by the way. I'm not. I'm not knocking it. Look, you're a woman. You're a woman. You just you have a female body. That that's just the reality. That's who you are. You can't change that. That's how God made you, and that's this is how God made me. You know, I mean, that's just the way it is. Um, but this Abigail girl, no, that 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 is that's not natural female bulkiness. That's man bulkiness that she's got. She is a. She has the body of a of a not just a man but a bulky man like a like a when i say bulky i'm not talking about just muscular i'm talking about also the 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 fat around the muscles as well that kind of guy you know your standard heavyweight ufc male fighter with just kind of small breasts that's all that's what she is <laughs> it's it's complete i cannot i can't even focus on the scenes that she's supposed to be in because i'm looking at this woman and i'm like what is going on it she's she is a she hulk it, it's disgusting and it's freakish I, it throws me off completely i can't get into any of the scenes that she's because i'm just constantly looking at this and like what the this this is just weird dude um yeah uh so i don't know where they were going with that one that i don't I, that just came out of nowhere it just doesn't make any sense so anyways dystopianism and storytelling the reason why i think the dystopian genre i think it's just kind of silly to be honest with you it may be a picky thing on my part but historically i guess it's a historical thing for me just would i can't i can never picture that ever happening and that's why dystopian stories now just i can't get into them because they just take me right out of the it, that that takes me out of the story um sorry uh it it uh it could never really happen. I don't know. You got to suspend reality at certain points, but I just think this is one of those areas where, in in my personal opinion, uh, is where you cross the line. Where it's just again, I can watch a dystopian ish movie show, whatever, but to uh, it's always in the back of my mind. This is kind of silly. Um, the idea that there would be no functioning government at all is to me it's just ridiculous human beings are stubborn and you, no matter how desperate things have gotten and, and you know there are times where obviously yeah government just went haywire but those are those were always localized they were never on a global scale it was always localized it was always in certain areas geographical areas where things have gone to poop and you know again like the wild west you know in the, in the wild west you know there's there's definitely a lot of anarchy going on but when you go east that's not the case um it was always localized because human beings are stubborn and even in the anarchy areas there was still some form of law and order uh functioning government whatnot um because human beings are stubborn in the fact that they they simply have to have some kind of order um so the idea that a plague of some kind would just you know like that just take over the entire world is is to me i just can't i can't i can't abide that you know it just kind of takes me out of the story it just it would never work in real life and so i always like watch these with a a little bit of a uh chip on my shoulder i guess you could say i'm just kind of like Ugh. 
If you want to say a city lost control, okay, that's fine. I get that. But the entire world thing is just, I think, just ridiculous. It's just stupid. Um, would never, ever happen. That's one of my little nuances. Um, <clears throat> the other reason, the final reason by this, this I think, Last of Us, the, the, like I said, what it has to do with The Walking Dead. And I wrote an article about this, about The Walking Dead, too, on my on my website, my blog, FindingTheBalance.net. Um what what this what this story where it fails miserably um, is in resolution to the plot and you know the the general lore itself. Uh, lore should not just be there as just kind of sitting there in a story. I don't think. I think it's there to provide a world for your characters to function. It provides depth to your world. Yeah, obviously that's that's really important. But it shouldn't be just kind of sitting there in limbo sort of you know just kind of it's just there um again it's it's a balance i think you have to find you have to have a balance between the lore and the characters obviously characters drive the story but that doesn't make the lore disappear into the background as this sort of meaningless jargon what do i mean i mean that i think the last of us and walking dead does this the the zombies and everything like that you know they in in the last of us the first one one of the reasons why I think the story was so interesting was because even though it focuses around a personal story between Joel and Ellie, that doesn't change the fact that there was still an overarching plot to save the world from this virus that's causing so much death and destruction. They could, you know, they, they have to endure this painful world together, but they could stop it by getting to their end goal in The Last of Us. It could, there was a resolution for all of this. Walking Dead kind of hinted at this a couple of times, but just blew all those up right in our faces. And goes right back to the nihilistic. Everybody's just trying to... Everybody's out to get each other. Try, some trying to survive. Everybody's trying to survive, but sometimes when they're trying to survive, ends up killing each other and just all kinds of back and forth, blah, blah, blah. But there's no resolution. Everybody's just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, left and right, up and down, you know, zigzagging and, all, and just killing each other. Who can do the worst to each other is, is what it ends up being. And there's no resolution in any of that. So why that's why people lost interest in The Walking Dead. And, and I think that's what, one of the big failures of The Last of Us, too. Is it, to my knowledge, just to, totally, it, it takes that main plot of fixing the great problem of this world, throws it out the window, turns it into a Ellie just getting revenge on these people. And what happens if Ellie does get revenge? What what is what what happens? So first of all, the people come after Ellie and Joel because apparently Joel and Ellie killed their people. So they they're on a, a revenge spree. So they kill Ellie's they kill Joel. Now what does Ellie do? Now she wants revenge. And, and you see, it's just it, the, the, what about now the zombies and 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 the huge plague going on? You you your characters become nothing more than part of the great problem that they were trying to solve in the first place. That's all they become. And the, the the whole points the 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 resolution is lost in the in the in all of this. It it just it's a big giant nihilistic story. It means nothing in the end. It it's just this is what again if you pay attention to a lot of where these stories today are flow. It's nihilism. It, it's you you can see this. And this is stuff that our kids are watching and they're, they're learning from these kinds of things. That's why storytelling is so important. That's one of the reasons that, that, you know, that I'm getting into storytelling, you know, is to try some, to tell a different story. Now, let me contrast that too, by the way. I want to I talk about something positive here. And we started watching... I haven't gotten really into this show. Again, I, I'm just... I don't know. I, I'm trying not to be a nag. I just... I hate to do it. I hate to do it, but I, I, I just can't help it. Um, so it's a show called Hannah on Prime, Amazon Prime. I mean, it's you, you, know, you, you have to be willing to check your worldview stuff, you know, and I, I have to do that. You know, it's just something you got to do. Um, and, you know, these little, it's kind of this idea of these, these sort of teenage female assassins <laughs> thing. Um, and, and I'm not saying that's impossible. That That's not impossible. But I see these girls go up against full-grown men and and do the things they do i'm just like no no not 
that would never happen. It just, I, I, I can't get us to suspend some reality, but do you have to suspend all of reality? I don't think you have to. I'm not saying that, that there's never an opportunity, never, never a way a young girl could take on a full grown man. But to just to do to go square with him and just do all to gotcha cry chop, uh, no, that's not going to happen. You you you've got to be able to, as a woman, to recognize this uh, this man is naturally bigger than I am, and that doesn't mean there's no hope. It means you've got to adjust. You've got to figure out a way to use his use your strengths and use his against himself. That that's what you have to do. It's just. And it's not just woman to man. That, that can be man to man sometimes. Uh, it's kind of the way it is. It's not about being the stronger. It's about being who's smarter, more strategic, even though strong strength is still important there. But um, it's it's really mind, mind over 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 body, you know. But anyways, that's not what the point I wanted to make. But uh, what I loved, we just finished, I think, season two, uh, watching it. You know what I loved about the ending of season two? I loved the fact that it ended season two on a high note. You notice most t TV shows when they end their seasons, it's always got to be this big old shock. Um, it's this huge shock and it's a horrible thing. And um, someone dies or someone gets badly hurt and it makes you go and it cuts off right before you know what, what, what happens. And they do that to make you come back for more. Um, and I, I think, that's cheap. I think that if you have to do that, you're not confident that your the story you're telling is enough in, in and of itself to make people come back. And that's one of the reasons why again people stop watching The Walking Dead after they you know Negan bashes in the heads of this guy of, you don't know who it is. I mean, wastes an entire episode teasing the moment, and when the moment comes, they cut it out just right before the very end and make you wait a whole another season. People got so pissed, and I, I frankly agree with them. That's when you know this show is dying, bad, fast, bleeding out. Um, it's just a, such a cheap shot. I mean, it's so cheap. I hate it when shows do that. Um, why can't you end on a high note? And people go, well, they won't want to come back for more. That's not true. If you're telling a good story, again, with good, strong characters, compelling characters, um, it doesn't really matter how you end it. Uh, people want to come back and see what happens next. I think Hannah did that great. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm interested in Hannah, the character Hannah. I want to see her her story grow. And season two sets the end of season two sets up for a season three in a great way that doesn't leave huge shockers of you know someone dying or something like that, and then make you want wait another season to see what happens next. It actually ends with all kinds of resolutions. But it ends with resolutions that lead to newer problems that, that will eventually arise when season three comes. And I, I loved that. I, I thought that was great. I was like, why can't you do that? And, and that I love that in shows. Um, so anyways, that, that's just, that was just a quick note there. Um, now, I want to get to now, finally. Uh, man, um, I hope I'm going to have the energy to do this, to be honest with you. Um, I want to talk about uh, what's something that Dan, Dr. Daniel Wallace, okay, shifting gears completely here. Dr. Daniel Wallace of Dallas Theological Seminary um, once said um, that there are many people who are willing to trade the truth for certainty. Now, in the context, what he was saying here was that he's talking about textual critical issues of, of the New Testament and, and things like that. Um, that people want to just know, I, I just want to know that I have the Word of God. I don't want to, I don't care about how it came about. I just want to know, I just want to, I want someone to just tell me, hey, you, you can be certain every single word is the Word of God in your Bible. You know, I just, I just, that's all I care about. You know, it's a black and white kind of thing like that, you know. They don't want to go into the issues related to the, the reliability of the New Testament. Just don't, they don't want to go there um, because it destroys their sense of certainty. Now, of course, as Dr. White noted, if you don't have truth, then you don't really have certainty. It's a certainty you've built on sand. Um, so, but he said, he said in remarks to 
uh, textual criticism. However, I have been, I've been thinking about that that statement for ever since I heard it uh, about a couple years ago, and it's always just stuck with me. And and it, I constantly keep like my mind keeps expanding upon it, and I really think it has a great application far farther out than just in textual critical issues. And that's what I want to do here in demonstrating sort of um, uh, the great, one of the biggest problems in our country today and really around the world. Um, it's the myth of absolute certainty. Now, let me make sure I, I, I clarify here what I'm talking about. I am not saying there's no such thing as absolute truth. There is absolutely, absolutely, there is absolute truth. Um, that's a different subject, though. That's not what I'm talking about here. Um, when you uh, when you look at the the division, the things that divide us today, you know, and you can think of anything you want. Think of think in theology, in in the Protestant Church, even in the Roman Catholic Church, if you want to get down to it. Um, uh, and, and even you know Protestantism versus Roman Catholic Catholicism and Eastern uh, Orthodox, um, and, but and then you also even in politics, you know, Democrat versus Republican. Uh, excuse me, but and, and, and baptism debates and stuff like that. Um, it's this need for this certainty um, that I think is causing so many problems. So what I mean is, I'm trying to pick an issue here to, to jump off from. Well, let's just take what Dan Wallace really meant. Okay, let's use that as our, our, our main issue here. Daniel Wallace was being critical, uh, I think, of uh, the King James Onlyists. Um, he's being critical of the King James Onlyists and uh, basically saying that they... The, the the great problem of the of the KJVO King James Onlyist is they want certainty and that's that's not a bad thing I want to be certain I have the word of God sure but in their pursuit of that certainty um throw out the truth really they 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 want a fictional idea of what the truth is and that is that black and white it's either this or that uh that's and that's really what it is that's really what we're dealing with here we're dealing with the black and the white either i have the word of god or i don't have the word of god um and the reality of the matter is you do have the word of god but how you have the word of god is not in the way that you want it, you want it to be it just it just isn't and if you're going if you're going to be an honest student of truth you have to have the maturity of mind and the patience the willingness to think hard upon these issues and i think that's what our society is unwilling to do again that's not just with the king james onlyism that's with everything everybody wants it either black or white the reason why they want a black or white is because it gives them that sense of like whatever I believe, I know it's true. With the coronavirus thing, I was talking with a brother today outside uh, the the abortion clinic. We were talking about the corona. We talked about a lot of things, but, but we were talking about the coronavirus issue. And I and I and I, I I remember saying to him, I was like, you know, honestly, this this whole coronavirus thing is just bizarre to me. I just uh, I, I I can't I almost can't even tell up from down with this whole thing. Um, there's just so much weirdness, so much inconsistency. I don't really know what to believe. The only thing I know for sure <laughs> is it's not what the government is telling us it is. That it's that the whole world's on fire or anything like that. I, I, that's all I know for sure. But in, talk, in terms of like it's spread, it seems so sporadic, irrational. It just, uh, uh, it's just strange to me. I, I don't get it a lot. You know, uh, I, a lot of times I just don't understand what's what's going on. And that's, that's my honest admission that I look, I'm looking at different sides of the issue um, and I, it's hard to tell what, what, what is what. But most people don't want to think about that. They just want to either coronavirus is a, um, the whole thing is a hoax or 
you know, it's 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 a it's we're going to hell in a handbasket and we're all going to die unless we uh, huddle up and you know hunker down in our homes. It's it's either one of those things, and, and I I think both of those views are incredibly simplistic, and are the results of people who just don't want to think about this. They they just they they just want a simple solution, this or that. That's what they want. It's the black and the white. That's how it's got to be. This idea of the black and the white, again, goes back to storytelling, by the way. You look at a lot of movies and TV shows today, and it's obviously, what do you see all the time? It's, there's a kind of duality going on. Uh, there's the good side and the bad side. The good guys and the bad guys. It's either this or that. Um, and uh, the good guys are always the good guys, even though they have some problems, but they're always the good guys. And, and, the, and the, 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 the righteous cause is so cut and dry, it's so clear. Uh, and there you go. In reality, though, it's not always that simple. Almost actually, and actually, it's rarely ever that simple. Um, there often is always the need to think carefully on issues. Uh, every single issue, I believe, has two sides in which it can fall off. You can fall off the rails on, and at least, at least two sides. And then the one important balance position. That's why, again, I call this finding the balance trying not to go too far off on one side or the other. Um, just because you reject uh, an unrighteous thing on one side does not mean you could fall for an unrighteous thing on the other side. You've got to be careful. Um, and, and, and so an example of this is, um, this kind of talks a little bit about conspiracy theories as well. Um, you know, my coworkers are always talking about conspiracy theories right now with, with a pedophilia stuff going on, Jeffrey Epstein and whatever. I was talking to one the other day about the Jeffrey Epstein uh, documentary that's on YouTube. Not on YouTube, on, on Netflix. Uh, I watched it. And it's got a lot of people, young women, who are victims of Jeffrey Epstein and their testimony and stuff like that. Now, we were my coworker and I were talking about this, and she and I, and I she told me, just straight up, like, oh, th- 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 this whole thing, is it's, it's absolutely true. I mean, the, the pedophilia thing in, in Hollywood, it's 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 true chase it's 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 really true it it, it is because and she was telling me that because i kept telling her i was like i've I've been looking into some of this stuff it's very interesting and and it's strange a lot of the way these celebrities are behaving it is really strange and awful lot of coincidences going on here and she goes no 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 there's no coincidences chase it's absolutely true and I, i i i told her i said well you know I, I think there's something to this, a lot of these conspiracies theories. Um, I think there's something to it, but y- you have to be careful. You don't have a smoking gun. Sorry, you, you don't. Jeffrey Epstein, sure, <laughs> but that's Jeffrey Epstein. There's a lot of good evidence of a lot of people connected to Jeffrey Epstein were doing a lot of these things. Like the Prince, Prince um, what's his name? Prince Andrews, I think. Uh, that's pretty, wow, that's... That does. I think you got some pretty compelling evidence on that guy that he had sexual relations with uh, these girls, um, and so yeah, I think that's that's pretty legit. Uh, so, but at the same time, I, I, I again, you notice I say I think there's there's their word versus his. Now, obviously, again, there's document the good documentation that something was going on. But this is like, again, the smoking gun. You can have the gunpowder, you can have the blood, but if you don't have the smoking gun, you're still missing something. And until you have that something, you, you can't just be running around saying, oh yeah, this it's this, it's that, it, boom, la. <laughs> you can, again, you can have your theories. I, I'm not against people having it. I, like, I think the Andrews thing, my, my opinion is that's legit. That guy is guilty, I think, in my opinion. But you notice how I'm constantly qualifying that with my opinion, my belief, because I don't have definitive proof. And until you have that, you've got to be careful because it's incredibly dangerous. R.C. Sproul has a book, uh, the, the Consequences of Ideas, you know, where he goes through the philosophical views of some of the most prominent philosophers in all of Western history and how their ideas shaped Western society. But these are just ideas. These are just beliefs. And yet these beliefs have consequences. They have lethal consequences. If you are not careful, 
and checking your personal biases, your ideas with the hard facts themselves, it, that can get extremely dangerous because it will it can cause you to project things onto people that aren't really true. Well, isn't that what Black Lives Matter does? I mean, you try to have a conversation with some of these people and try to try to show them, you know, hey, look, historically, this is or, or the, you know, the statistically, oh, no, 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 you know, you, you're just oppressive of black people. You know, you're just you're just buying into the system and you're marked out now and people will come after you because these people have an idea that far overshadows the truth of the matter, the reality. And they've made up their mind. And when people have just made up their mind, that's when you have a cult. That's when you have a people who just they just won't listen to anything else. They, they, and, and what happens is when they're confronted with data that contradicts what they've already made up in their mind, they begin to try to, again, talking to my coworker about some of these things, I could see it, you know, you know, you ever have that happen to you when, when, when someone's like going off on something, you know, blah, 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 and then you just go, well, what about, you know, and such and such, this and that, and then you, see, sometimes you can see them do this, you know, looking up, you know, and, and, uh, yeah, well, uh, you know, and all of a sudden, it, you know, the reason why they're doing it is because suddenly I never thought about that before, you know, that, that's what happens. And they, 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 I, that never crossed my mind. Yeah. Yeah. You, you think you might need to check some of these things before you just jump onto something? You've got to be careful. And this whole things need to be black and white is one of the causes of all of this. This whole, it's, it's this, it's got to be this, it can't be anything else. And in reality, not always the case. you got to be careful. You've got to be, you know, I was talking to uh, Brother Chris, Chris New, about some conspiracy theories. And how I do believe some conspiracy theories are legit. Um, but I also told him, you know, we also got to be careful, you know, that we don't just jump onto conspiracy theory bandwagons left and right. Um, I always find them interesting subjects. Uh, I think a lot of the coronavirus stuff, for example, is legit problematic. Um, that there is good reason to question a lot of that stuff. Um, but he was telling me about these wacky JFK conspiracy theories. And I'm just like, uh, okay, that's a little out there. <laughs> That'd make for a good movie. <laughs> but no, uh, that, that, uh, no, <laughs> that's just ridiculous. Um, but, uh, you, you, you some people just want to, they, they want to be ahead of the curve. And what they end up doing is, is ironically become more gullible than they think they are. And just buying into conspiracy theories left and right, never asking questions. You know, the 9-11 thing again. I have a coworker who believes 9-11 was a complete conspiracy theory. He doesn't believe in the, that there were planes that hit the building. And I'm just like, dude, how, how do you like, – that, that's that's ridiculous. And it's like, well, you, you know, the CGI. And I'm like, oh. Uh, okay. You know, there were thousands of people who saw it. And hundreds, if not thousands, of cameras filming. Not just news cameras, but regular, ordinary people. A lot of the documentaries you see on the issue, more than half of that, I think actually, yeah, most of it is not even actually from the news. It's from people on the ground. You're telling me that there's every single person who was filming, who just was filming all that, was in on the hoax? Every single person. And that their, their, their entire, all the footage that they filmed was tampered with and they they put cgi in there to make it look like it was a play i mean that's that's just, just ridiculous um and what it demonstrates is people who want to believe that there's more to the story but are not really willing to go to do the homework that it takes to understand where the conspiracy actually would be and now i've i've watched stuff on 9 11 that questions a lot of the narrative that are compelling and they're too complex for me to get into here because, again, it it and that just shows that you know these are people who who don't just buy into just the most shallow level conspiracy theory stuff, but actual legit things that, um, you know, it, are are believable are actually believable, 
Um, so, you know, there's that. So, you know, I'm talking to my co my coworker about the, the, the Jeffrey Epstein thing and, and Bill Clinton. Okay, so the, in the documentary, the girls who were, who were on the island, who were abused on the island, uh, who claimed to have been abused on the island, will will say that even Bill Clinton was there. And there was a guy who was a, uh, an, an electrician, an electrical engineer who worked on the island, said he saw Bill Clinton on the island. Now, we all know Bill Clinton, yeah, he's a, he's a freaking perv, okay? We got it. We all get it. However... None of these people in this in this documentary ever said Bill Clinton acted inappropriately. Never touched them. Never abused them when he was on the island. They, they, there was no accusations made against him. Now you would think that that's the perfect moment to to catch Bill Clinton. You've, your credibility has already been shot through the roof. You could have really laid something on Bill Clinton right then and there, but they didn't. You, you had all the reason to. And there's. You, you had your credibility. You already had former clear evidence that Bill Clinton has done some really pervy things in the past. You, it's all there, and yet you didn't do it. I think that says something. And so I told his coworker, I said, there's no claims that he did anything on the island. So as much as we might want to say, and legitly so, that Bill Clinton is corrupt and that he is a weirdo, uh, there's nothing on him about this. That, that we know of, at least that I know of. And she, you could, I could tell that she, she knew I was right, but didn't want to accept it. But I'm just like, you, 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 you have to go with the evidence. You cannot just be, you can, again, you can say, you know, I, I threw a couple theories at her. Now, so I said, you know, now it could be that, that either A, he really didn't do anything, and which is surprising, or, Maybe he paid them off well enough to not say anything about what he did. Uh, who knows? That's a theory. I have no evidence for any of that whatsoever, but that's a theory for why they didn't say anything about it. I think it's going to be kind of one of those two. I tend to believe the first one um, because the second one, again, I got no evidence, no leverage for that whatsoever. Um, so it could be one of those two, but that's really all you can do because you don't have a smoking gun. You don't have eyewitness testimony of him doing anything weird on the island. Uh, now, they did accuse Alan Dershowitz, uh, Epstein's lawyer, who is far less reputable than Bill Clinton. So, uh, you know, that I think is, is also kind of interesting. But they accused, one of them accused him. Uh, so, uh, that's interesting. That's really interesting, I think. You go after that guy, but you don't go after Bill Clinton. You're, you got, you got clear targets on Bill Clinton and not so much on Alan Dershowitz because there's not really much of a reputation of him being a, a, a child molester and you go after him rather than Bill Clinton I think that's saying something so um, but again there's just this she she's already bought the theory she's already bought into all of this and so just doesn't want to accept that you know man, there's some I gotta work through some of this in other words You've got to think through this. You've got to be careful. Um, you got to go where the evidence takes you. But most people don't want to do that. They, they want to know that what they believe is certainly true. And they'll do whatever it takes to do that. King James Onlyists will do whatever it takes to believe that the King James Bible is word for word the absolute word of God. And that's not, that's just not the case. It's not true. Historically, it's not true. Now, you know, again, if you prefer the King James, I'm like, sure, okay, that's fine. You can prefer the King James. I, I got no problem with it. But when you say the King James Bible is the only inspired, you know, the only true word of God, uh, true translation, I'm like, uh, got a bit of a problem now. So, um, that, that's, uh, that, that's what I think is what's wrong with our society. You have, You've got these factions and stuff like that who, who go, these people, all this and that, blah, 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 and, and him this and him that, she this and she that, uh, constantly going after each other. And it, like in the Black Lives Matter thing, again, with my coworkers who are sympathetic to the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, uh, are, are, are kind of seem to be, at least, to, at least to be saying, 
that they're okay with defunding the police. And I'm just like, what? I mean, that. come on, say it ain't so. Um, it, you, you, it's easy when you're just looking at this from a surface level to look at it and go, black lives, black black people are being oppressed and whatever, and they're being targeted. You know, look at all look at all the black communities that are being targeted. Uh, like the police are constantly looking at black people, you know, the, the profiling and whatnot, you know, just because he's black and everything like that. Now, there's truth to that. Yeah, there's truth to that. But is it because the police are just racist and the institutions are just racist? So you, you you could sit there and you can say, well, you know, look at all this 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 stuff that happens to black people, you know, constantly. Rumor, don't eat it. It's my dog. Sorry. Um, but you 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 know. But then I uh, if I go well, yes, blacks are targeted more, but. You also have uh, is the solution to make to do white reparations or what if a lot of the reason is because 70 percent of black families no father functioning in the home uh, with no father functioning in the home to be a good father figure to those kids uh, and, and, a, and a functioning marriage uh, those those boys those young boys grow up without a dad someone to look up to someone who is dignified pulls his pants up uh you know these kinds of things like that and has a job works an honest living so they don't have any of this so they get involved they, they find the wrong crowds they look for father figures and the wrong people um, get involved in crime uh next thing you know they're shooting people um you know raping whatever thief thievery getting again getting involved in crime and so naturally yeah they're going to be constantly targeted by the police because they're doing these crimes and why why fatherless homes broken families the girls likewise have no father who's teaches them what a man should be um and so they go off looking for men in the, all the wrong places and end up pregnant and then the system feeds into this by giving them benefits for being moms without a, a, a father, um, you know, without a dad being there. You know, single moms. They, they, they get benefits for being single moms. They don't got to work anymore. Um, you know, they don't really care about raising them. Those kids are nothing but uh, more money in the bank for them. That's all they are. And they don't care what those kids are doing. So those kids go off and do, and you just constantly produce and, and this same thing. And that's that's why the black community is where it, where it's at. Now, if I throw that in the mix, all of a sudden, oh, okay, well, I never thought about that before. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, it may tell you that this is a little bit more complicated than than what you thought it was. It's a little bit more complicated, isn't it? Now, at the same time, I'm not saying that there's not a problem with the police. Sure, yeah, I, I think the police need to be able need to better training more discipline i don't think you gotta get you're supposed to get rid of them though that's that's ridiculous and stupid you gotta invest in their training more and and more non-lethal tr uh, takedowns and stuff like that and being more involved in their community uh these these kinds of things if you do those two things i think you fix the problem um this isn't fixing the problem this is refusing to acknowledge the problem and then therefore making the problem worse but see, when I throw that in there, now all of a sudden it's not that simple. But see, people don't want to think about that. They want things to be just black and white. It's just, well, black people are targeted, so what we got to do is we got to even the, even the odds by making less white people being able to go to college and more black people being able to go to college and blah, 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 blah. All this stuff. That's not equality. That's not equality at all. And that is not going to fix the problem. Um, so... Uh, that's 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 the thing is, is that you want simple solutions you want certainty but you don't really want the truth and the truth is there are gray areas that you have to be able to navigate and to navigate those you've got to be a thinking person a mature person someone who's cares about balance really cares about being careful balanced thinking honestly through issues and most people don't want to do that. They just don't want to do that. And that's why 
we are in the rut that we're in and it will get worse and worse until we have a people who are willing to you know the more i study history the more often i i kind of get a little lost i go man dude this i'm learning a lot about church history that my particular beliefs are kind of small and it, it's just a bit of a blip in the in, in history not to mention my own country itself and the only and the actual thinking process of my of individualism in the united states it's kind of a new idea in history and i've had to come to terms with the fact that you know things aren't that simple the baptism debate which i once previously thought was a simple thing really wasn't as simple after all um there's a long history to it the issues of Christology, not that simple. The textual criticism, yeah, wasn't that simple. There's a lot more to it. Uh, issues of um, eschatology, not as simple as I once thought it was. Government, not all that simple. You know, my coworker just says, when we talk about the, the corporate America and stuff like that, she goes, Again, she just goes, it, it, it's all the government. It's all the government doing it. It's all that. And I'm like, uh, yes and no. It's 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 not that simple. There's a lot of private industry involved in it, unfortunately. Sadly, that's what corporatism is. Um, but there's it's, it, it's more complicated. You can't just, you cannot afford to simplistically buy into these things. You've got to be willing to think long and hard and careful about these things. But we're so boom, 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 boom. We're so, I got to do this, I got to do this. We just don't have time to, and, and it embeds in us this, this, this just constant movement. When was the last time? You know, one of the things I like to do, I'm reading, again, church history, reading this, you know, this uh, 2,000 years of Christ's power. I'm in the Middle Ages right now. I'm slowly working through this thing. Um, but, you know, I'm in the Middle Ages. Um, and what I like to do is I like to read a chapter. I'll sit and I'll just read a chapter. And I'll listen to some Bach while I'm, while I'm reading. It's really relaxing. It's really enjoyable. And when I'm done, I'll close the book. And I'll kind of just sit and I'll think about what I just read. When was the last time you did something like that? I'm not trying to toot my own horn. I'm just, just something to think about, you know, something to think about. Uh, when was the last time you did something like that? Don't you think that we could use more of that in our society today? More, more people willing to just, dude, pause, time out. I need to just, I need to sit and think. And when I say, see, this is the thing. We go, well, you know, I do take some time off. Yeah, but what are you doing when you take a time off? This is what you're doing when you're sitting and relaxing. That's not sitting to contemplate and think. I'm talking about. I read some something from here. I got a little a little Bach going on because it's really relaxing, really enjoyable music. And then I close it and I just kind of watch the trees, the wind blow in the trees, and I'm just I just think about what I'm what I've read, and compare it to everything else I've read, put it in this context in history, and contemplate on whether or not it has an effect on me today, um, what kind of effect, and these kinds of things. That that's something that we need to do more often. That's something that people of the past did all the time and we don't do that anymore don't you think that has some kind of correlation to why things are getting crazier and crazier and crazier i think it does i think it does that's something that we need to have happen more often read a book a good book and think about it for a while if you're just scrolling through facebook and social media you're not thinking about it put it down put it away and just think about it um, walk away from this 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 podcast or this this webcast and think about some of the things that were said here for a little while just think about it so um, you the truth is things are not as simple as we want them to be people are not as simple as we want them to be and we have to be willing we have to have the maturity of mind we have to be adults and think about that. Think long and hard about that. That's what our society needs more of today. And it's what it's what is getting less of right now. You know, the the statues coming down. Uh, I don't want to get too far into that, but again, 
look, you may not like some of these people. Um, uh, Columbus, you may have your ideas, your beliefs about Columbus uh, or General Lee, who is uh, a general in the Confederate Army, you know, from the South. Uh, you, you can have your opinions about these people, but they are part of our history. They are. And if you're going to be an honest person who seeks truth, you have to teach about these guys. You can't just throw them away in the past because if you do, um, we forget our history and we repeat it. That's why it's really important to preserve historical artifacts, to teach people. If it, It's one thing. You can sit there and you can tell. And I, I'll finish with this. I asked my coworkers, um, do you think that we should have destroyed all those German artifacts, those Nazi artifacts that the dead Germany did? And they basically said, yeah. And, you know, my, one of my coworkers, she's like, you know, why, why should we let somebody uh, create a museum out of these things and make money off of this? And I, I thought, I was listening and I was like, that means you should just destroy every single museum because they're making money off of people's, off of history. It's just, I hate to say it, but just, it's sad to me to see how little thinking is being done with, with, with these, just jumping to conclusions like that. Just, just uh, well, Nazism is bad. Just boom. Therefore, just get rid of everything. And anybody who who makes money off of museums about this, I think they're just a uh, greedy capitalist. You know, but it's like no. Maybe he's he, he loves history, whether it's good or bad, and wants to teach people about it. How important it is to know about this. And I think maybe why why can't he make a profit off of what he loves to do? <laughs> it's it's, it's it, she she jumped to that answer so fast and, and just didn't think through. What she just said, uh, just there's a lot of emotions going on too, a lot of preaching, it, just not a whole lot of thinking through it. Uh, anyways, um, uh, so and I don't just say that to be mean. I, I, that's it's just dangerous this kind of thinking where it's going. Someone's got to call it out and just say, "Don't do this. Don't go that way. I don't want you to go that way. It's dangerous. It's harmful to you. It's harmful to the future too." Um, but I, I think we should have preserved a lot of those. I would love to have the, the Berkhoff, Hitler's home, to have been preserved. Wow, would it have been interesting to walk through that thing. To just That would have been fascinating. Um, again, not because I like Hitler, but just because it's history. It's it's, and, and so one of my arguments for preserving these things is because, and she said, my coworker said, you know, you, just, you don't have to have these things here to read about them in history, to, to tell people about these things and stuff like that. That's true. But see the tendency that we have as human beings. And I was talking to a, you know one of the things I was talking to a brother about this morning in, in the abortion clinic is even when we read our Bible, you know, uh, yeah, that's real history. But you talk to a lot of people who go to who, Christians who have gone to Jerusalem and to Israel and seen these places, and they go, dude, that changes the way you you read your Bible. It changes it. It really brings perspective. Why does it bring perspective? Why? Because you saw the place, the real place where these things happened. You saw, you beheld the artifacts themselves that bore witness that this was not mythology. This really happened. And if all you've got are words and maybe a couple pictures here and there, like a painting or whatever, and even just an autographic photo, you know, like a photograph, um, even that only goes so far. Um, it, that that's not going to really fix the problem. People eventually are just going to treat it like it was mythology. But if they go to the actual place and they see it, that changes everything. I mean, that that will tell people. I believe, truly believe, it'll tell people this really happened. Oh my. God. God, this really happened. We, we got to make sure this never happens again. Keep this here. Tell people about this. Warn them about this so that it never happens again. That's what I think is what that's that's why it's so important. And I don't know if you got off onto that thing, but uh, anyways, don't trade the truth for certainty. Make sure you're always focused on the truth. And the truth sometimes is going to take you to places that force you to think, really think, challenges you. 
but you got to be willing to do it. If you're not willing to do it, you become part of the problem. Sorry, you do. Uh, it's not that simple. It's much more complicated. Uh, it often really is. Now, there's not, there's not to say there aren't situations where it's just pretty cut and dry. You know, you're either killing a baby in the womb or you're not, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, you're either you're pro-life or pro-death. You know, people say, well, I'm not pro, I'm not either. I'm pro-life, but I'm also, I also, you know, I would never kill the baby, but I, I think it's a woman's right to choose. Well, then you're pro-choice and you're pro-death. You're pro-killing the baby. There's there's no gray area there. It's black and white, cut and dry. <laughs> so, uh, so that's, there's that, you know. So uh, faith alone, you're either justified by faith alone or by faith in something else, and which is not faith alone. It's either or. That's pretty clear, cut and dry. You know, you're either preaching the gospel or you're not. Um, but in a lot of these other issues, like I was just talking about, it ain't that simple. So, anyways, um, I hope that this is uh, useful to you guys, helpful as always. You know, that's the uh, reason why I do these. Um, remember, okay, be careful. Don't trade the truth for certainty. Soledad Gloria. God bless. Talk to you guys later.